Uh, Garen works in several areas of planetary science, including uh, cometary science and the physics of the icy moons of the outer solar system. He has worked on missions such as Giotto, Ulysses, and the Cassini Huygens mission to Saturn and its moons, and is a co investigator on the PanCam instrument built for ESO's ExoMars rover. We heard a little bit about it this morning. Uh, Dr. Jones will address us on ESA, uh, the JUICE mission uh, to the icy moons of Jupiter. Hey, good, after good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for the very kind welcome. Uh, is the microphone working? Uh, how about now? No. <laughs> so I'll, I'll shout for a bit. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about JUICE, uh, which as Mark mentioned this morning may have a, a name change in the not too distant future, but it's an, ex an extremely exciting mission uh, to the Jupiter system to study Jupiter itself and uh, the icy moons that, uh, that orbit it. Um, so this is where I work, the, uh, the Mild Space Science Laboratory, so it's part of University College London and it was, uh, we'll be celebrating uh, the 50th anniversary next year. Uh, so we're sitting on a hill in Surrey, uh, looking south uh, um, towards the South Downs. There are 175 of us working there with the largest university-based uh, space science group in, in the UK. Um, so some of the planetary missions that we have been involved in and will be involved in in the future include Giotto to, to Comet Halley and then to Comet Griggs-Gelderup. Mars 96, a really ambitious Russian mission which unfortunately didn't make it, but we built an enormous instrument for it, but uh, such is life. Mars Express, which has been a, a monumental success for ESA and Mars, and uh, we built the, the cameras for Beagle 2, which uh, did, as we now know, make it down to the surface, unfortunately not communicating with Earth. Venus Express uh, has also been a huge success for ESA, orbiting uh, um, Venus, and then Cassini-Huygens has been fantastic. We built the uh, electron spectrometer um, for the, the CAPS instrument, so we've been learning about the magnetosphere of, uh, of Saturn um, and the way it interacts with the moons. We didn't build any hardware for Rosetta, but um, we're, uh, we're involved in the science, so uh, looking forward to, being, to observing 67P uh, from a week tonight, actually, at the Isaac Newton telescope. So observing the comet while Rosetta is observing it at the same time. And this will be during the, the time we're crossing the, uh, the orbital plane of the comet. Uh, finally, as was mentioned, we're, uh, we're involved in the ExoMars rover due to launch uh, in two years' time. So we're building the, the PanCam uh, camera, science camera, that will be on the mast of, of ExoMars. And finally, JUICE, which is the topic of, uh, of today's talk. So as well as that, we've also got involvement in lots of uh, astrophysics missions such as Euclid, the Plato, XMM Newton, and uh, uh, so other solar system missions such as uh, Cluster and uh, SOHO. So uh, as everyone here is very uh, uh, familiar with, it, Jupiter is the largest planet, um, so you could easily fit 10 Earths side by side across uh, uh, the diameter of uh, Jupiter's disk. So this Planetary Society slide shows you all the planets um, to scale, and um, apart from Saturn's rings, you can clearly see that the Jupiter dwarfs all the others, so it has the, the most mass, um, it has more mass than all the other planets uh, combined. And um, it has been studied in, uh, in some detail in the past with flybys, and we had the Galileo mission, uh, the NASA mission to, to Jupiter in the 1990s, uh, which was incredibly exciting, but which was unfortunately hampered by the fact that its main antenna didn't unfurl. It was designed like an umbrella to fit in the space shuttle cargo bay, and unfortunately uh, some of the pins of that uh, antenna didn't unfurl. So the amount of data it was able to send back was, was limited. So JUICE will fill in a lot of the, uh, um, the gaps that uh, Galileo uh, would have um, uh, told us a lot about and will do a, a huge amount more as well. So from past missions we've, uh, we've learned a lot. So from the upper left uh, we had the fleeting flybys of the Pioneer 10 and 11 missions in the early 1970s and then the Voyagers in the, uh, in the late 1970s flying past Voyager 1 and 2 and then as we heard uh, this morning uh, from James had uh, observations also from, from New Horizons on its way to Pluto, also Cassini 
uh, Galileo, of course, and also Ulysses, which was a polar orbiting solar spacecraft which uh, went through the Jupiter system in 92 but didn't carry any cameras. So uh, it was quite low key um, in that respect. Um, and as we've also seen this morning from the amazing images from, uh, from Hubble, uh, Jupiter's an amazing uh, sight. So you're all familiar with looking at it through a telescope. And even through a modest size instrument, you can clearly see the bands of the, of the atmosphere. Um, it's churning atmosphere is bringing up different chemicals up to the surface, so at different times you can see different uh, chemicals at different latitudes. Uh, several long-lived storms and of course the, the great red spot. And uh, in the image there you can see um, a shadow of one of the moons uh, as well crossing the disk. So amateur images as well are, are informing um, our knowledge of Jupiter, so uh, some of the amazing work done by um, amateurs such as Damon Peach and others is, uh, is incredibly valuable to provide this long-term, uh, near-continuous observations of the, of the surface of, uh, or the cloud tops of Jupiter, and in so doing we learn about um, things such as uh, asteroid or comet impacts into the, the atmosphere, which professionals would otherwise uh, miss out on. So um, what we can see from the Earth is, is great, but it's, uh, it's enhanced many, many times by actually going there uh, with um, cameras and other remote sensing instruments to study the planet close up over a wide range of wavelengths. So the Earth's atmosphere blocks out many wavelengths, so we can't see uh, at all colors um, the atmosphere of Jupiter. And also by carrying in situ uh, instruments such as magnetometers to measure the magnetic field and particle instruments, we learn things that it's basically impossible to know about from, uh, from Earth as well. So that's the impetus behind um, missions uh, such as JUICE. So I'll just touch on uh, briefly some of the different areas of science that we'll be addressing. So um, JUICE will uh, orbit Jupiter monitoring the atmosphere. So features such as the Great Red Spot, which has uh, been in existence for a few centuries at least, um, will be monitored um, for a few years during a JUICE mission at a, a very high spatial resolution. The aurora um, is uh, particularly special at Jupiter. So like the Earth, Jupiter has a, has a, has a magnetic field. And um, the way that this magnetic field interacts with uh, the solar wind, which is flowing out from the sun, means that it's, uh, the regions around its north and south poles glows uh, through the uh, um, particles hitting the upper atmosphere. So this shows uh, one of the poles of Jupiter, and you can see an oval uh, similar to uh, that which we have at, uh, at the Earth's north and south poles. But also you can see spots. Um, so at the left there you see a bright spot with what appears to be a tail, uh, and two spots on the, the lower right as well. And these are actually regions which are magnetically connected to the large moons. So um, the large moons of Jupiter are sitting inside the planet's magnetic field. And as they move through the magnetic field, uh, we get this electrodynamic interaction which uh, generates currents, accelerates particles. They strike the upper atmosphere of Jupiter, and we can actually see uh, those particles striking the upper atmosphere as these uh, auroral spots. Um, Jupiter also has rings, so it's incredibly difficult to see these uh, from the Earth. Um, so this image is from uh, uh, Keck, one of the Keck telescopes, and it brings them out. So um, these rings are actually discovered um, by in situ cameras or by uh, um, spacecraft passing by Jupiter and looking back and seeing uh, backlit rings. Um, that's how they were discovered. And, um, this is another aspect, clearly they're not as, uh, as extensive and as impressive as the rings of Saturn, uh, but there's lots of interesting dynamics going on uh, between the rings and some of the uh, inner moons such as Amalthea. Uh, and that material, the dust that's in a band uh, forming the rings around the equator of Jupiter provides some information about um, what was almost certainly a, mo a moon that broke up in the, in the distant past. So this is also an area that uh, we hope to address with JUICE. Uh, but arguably, one of the most exciting, uh, well, arguably the most exciting bit of the, the mission is learning more about the moons, the Galilean moons. So Galileo discovered uh, these four bright moons, uh, now collectively named after him. 
And you can see his notes in the upper left there. He actually also observed Uranus with his primitive telescope, but didn't realize that that was a planet at the time. Um, and for a few centuries, we knew nothing about uh, the moons. Uh, they were nothing more than uh, the bright specks of, of light on either side of the planet, uh, moving from night to night. Uh, the Pioneer spacecraft, both of them, uh, they had um, fairly rudimentary cameras, so we didn't learn a huge amount about the moons from the, the data from those missions. But the two Voyager spacecraft revealed these worlds to be fascinating places in their own right. So uh, here we're seeing Europa, seen from Pioneer 10, Voyager 1, and Galileo. And with uh, increasing spatial resolution, we learn more and more about uh, uh, the, the moons of Jupiter. So Europa itself, as I'll uh, go into a bit more detail now, uh, is one of the particularly facet fascinating uh, bodies. So these four moons, the Galilean moons, um, if they were orbiting on their own, uh, I'm sure we'd have flown missions to them uh, by now as well. They are worlds in their own right. Um, but the way that they've developed is, um, is, would have been very different if they had been orbiting uh, on their own. The fact that they're orbiting Jupiter with its incredibly intense gravitational pull and accompanied by other large moons means that there are huge tides raised in, uh, in these moons, particularly Io and Europa. So they're ordered here in terms of size rather than distance from, um, from Saturn. Uh, from Jupiter, sorry. <laughs> uh, so we have Ganymede on the left, which is the largest moon in the solar system, actually larger than Mercury, uh, which will be the ultimate target of, of Juice, where the mission will end. Callisto, which is the outermost uh, moon, uh, which is the least heated by these tidal effects. Uh, Io, an incredibly active volcanic moon, which is the closest of these four uh, to Jupiter, uh, as we saw this morning, is uh, constantly erupting um, with several volcanic hotspots visible at any one time. And then Mer uh, Europa on the, the right there. So um, all of them uh, will tell us more about uh, the history of the Jupiter system and also the uh, tantalizing possibility that they're habitable, uh, at least um, one of them, maybe two, and maybe even potentially maybe home to uh, life today. So if we order all the, um, the, the moons of the solar system according to, to size, so this is a, another slide from the Planetary Society uh, put together by Emily Lactuella. Um, you can see Ganymede as the largest, followed by Titan, the large moon of Saturn, um, Callisto, Io, our moon, and then just slightly smaller than our moon uh, is Europa. So this mission uh, will be visiting um, four of the largest uh, six moons in the, in the solar system. So first of all, uh, Europa. Um, as you can see, it's covered in, uh, in cracks. Uh, it's a fascinating world because we think that uh, under its icy crust is a global ocean of water ice. So the way that this has been learnt is that uh, uh, as spacecraft have gone past it, uh, we learnt a lot from Galileo, the spacecraft. Um, the, ma the magnetometer on Galileo recorded a deviation in the magnetic field uh, as it went past Europa. And this is actually consistent with a salty ocean under the surface. And as uh, Jupiter's magnetic field is changing as Jupiter rotates, and it's setting up currents in the interior of Europa. Uh, and these, um, the signal from these currents can be detected by magnetometers. Also, as you can clearly see, the images of the surface um, clearly support the view that um, uh, it probably has a relatively thin crust. And almost everything that you see there is, is water ice. Um, so, Many of these bodies, with the exception of Io, almost everything we see is water ice. So we're so far from the sun, the amount of heating is quite limited, um, so the temperatures are quite low, and water takes the place of rock. So we have bodies such as Europa, which are very smooth and um, very few impact craters, suggesting that it's very young, or comparatively young in, in geological terms, so maybe only a few million years old. Uh, these cracks where there are clear signs of the, the surface breaking up water, upwelling um, through those cracks and then spreading out onto the surface, uh, revealing this uh, very flat 
young um, terrain. So if we uh, look uh, more closely at the surface, um, we can see uh, that there are very, very few impact craters, as I mentioned. This is the largest impact crater, and one of the things I personally like about Europa is that it has Welsh place names. So this is Pwyll, <laughs> P-W-Y-L-L. Um, so you can see here that uh, this um, moderate-sized impact uh, has thrown up ice from beneath the surface, and it's covered, um, this ray crater has covered some of the older features uh, on, the, on the surface of, of Europa. In other regions of the, of the surface, we can clearly see uh, the hints of what appears to be uh, um, a region that used to be open water in the past. So it's very similar to ice flows on the Earth where you have icebergs, um, an ice shelf breaking up and, and icebergs rearranging themselves. Um, whether that's exactly how this region uh, was formed is open to question. Maybe it was more of a slushy environment, so it looks as if it might have been open water. Uh, but it may be ice, which is maybe contaminated by ammonia, making it more fluid. Uh, so it may have been a, a more slow motion process that broke up uh, the surface of Europa in this region. In other places, we can see clear signs of what appear to be ice volcanoes. So these little domes uh, appear where water, uh, liquid water acting as lava, or maybe, as I just said, this sort of more slushy uh, convection was going on, uh, rise, raising bits of the surface to, to form these small uh, mounds that, the, that, that have the equivalent of, uh, of volcanoes. So we don't know at the moment exactly what's under the, the surface of Europa. Uh, is it like the, the picture on the left with a relatively thin crust uh, overlying a, um, a quite a deep ocean and then at the floor of the ocean you might have volcanoes or um, uh, active smokers as we have at the, um, some areas of the, of the ocean floor on the earth or is it more like the picture on the right with a thicker crust where you still get some convection um, ice moving really gradually uh, so although it's a, it's a solid in effect, it's, it is moving very gradually as a fluid, uh, driving this convection that slowly disrupts the surface and occasionally forms these, uh, th these cracks. There are hints um, from observations with the Hubble Space Telescope a couple of years ago that um, the surface of Europa might even be active today. Uh, there were a few observations that indicated that there was a, a plume uh, at high southern latitudes um, but since that one observation, which was incredibly exciting, uh, there have been no observations that have confirmed this. So um, the observers involved are incredibly uh, uh, careful, um, and the, uh, their data reduction is, is there's no reason to disbelieve it, but it may be the case that uh, if the surface is active, it may just be occasional, so it might not be like Enceladus, which as far as we can tell, is, is erupting almost continuously. So Ganymede um, is the ultimate uh, destination of the JUICE mission. So Ganymede hasn't been, um, has obviously got a much thicker crust than Europa. Uh, some regions of the surface are relatively young, so there are, there are fewer impact craters, and you can see even on this large scale, of lar large regions which are brighter, like that band running down from the top, where in the past the crust has probably uh, stretched apart with uh, possibly um, water ice lava coming through to the surface. Um, but it is uh, quite different to Europa in appearance and in interior um, structure as well. So this shows a, a couple of close-ups of the, of the surface, and you can see uh, in the upper image where um, there may have been some uh, extension of the surface um, forming these cracks, which are vaguely similar to the, the cracks that cover the surface of Europa. Um, and we want to learn more about this, so to map the surface of, of Ganymede uh, at very high resolution to learn about the, um, the processes that have uh, uh, affected the, the surface. Now, if you look at the image at the upper uh, left, um, which I believe is from Galileo, the colors have been stretched uh, um, quite a bit, so it's not exactly how you'd see Ganymede with your eye, but you might notice that the poles are a little blue, and at lower latitudes, 
the, the surface is uh, more brownish. And there's a very good reason for that. It's, uh, it is real. And the, that, the, the cause of that is that Ganymede has its own magnetic field. So as far as we know, it's uh, unique in all moons in our solar system. Our moon's got very small regions of, of uh, weak magnetic fields, but Ganymede has got its own global magnetic field. So if you were to go there with a compass, it would point uh, uh, towards one of the poles. And this is really a complicated situation. So you've got Jupiter with its incredibly strong magnetic field. And within that magnetosphere, the region where uh, the Jupiter's magnetic field dominates, you've got this large moon, the largest moon in the solar system, with its own magnetic field as well. So these green lines map the, uh, the magnetic field lines. This is a, a, a simulation of what we think is going on there. So the, the magnetic field was discovered by the Galileo spacecraft. And when JUICE uh, maps Ganymede at high resolution towards the end of its mission, all the in-situ uh, plasma instruments and magnetometer will be mapping uh, this complex magnetic field and learning about how it interacts with Jupiter's uh, magnetic field. Now, the cause of the color differences that I mentioned is directly related to this. So the magnetic field lines you see coming down from the top, they actually originate at Jupiter and at the South Pole as well. And then around the equator, um, we have the, uh, the magnetic field of Ganymede itself. So the Jupiter's magnetic field doesn't get down to those low latitudes. And that's thought to be the cause of this color difference. So we, got en we have energetic particles from Jupiter's magnetosphere striking the poles of Ganymede, but not getting uh, to the, the regions closer to the equator. So we've got some hints of what's going on from the Galileo spacecraft, but the only way to learn uh, about this uh, really fascinating uh, place and the interaction it has with Jupiter's magnetic field is to actually go there and orbit the moon as well, and that's what we'll do with JUICE. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have Callisto, um, which could be argued to be the least interesting of the, the four Galilean moons. Um, but it, it acts as a sort of a time capsule. It's um, almost saturated with craters, though there are a few places where there may have been activity in the distant past. So it actually is a, a time capsule showing us um, the impact history of, uh, of the Jupiter system. Um, and by mapping it at high resolution, we'll have many flybys of Callisto. We'll learn about um, some of the external influences on the, the Jupiter system its itself. So we can compare the, um, the surface of Callisto, which is largely unchanged by interior processes, just peppered by countless uh, uh, impacts from uh, comets and asteroids, with the surfaces of Ganymede and Europa, which are clearly much younger. Now, I haven't dwelt on your IO at all, because um, we will be making observations of IO with JUICE, but um, because the radiation belts of Jupiter are incredibly intense close to the planet, JUICE will not be visiting uh, IO. So some of the instruments will observe it from afar, but uh, um, somewhat reluctantly, um, uh, ESA decided that it's best to um, design a spacecraft which will be safer further away from the planet, so we don't need the heavy shielding that's needed to protect the instruments if we were to go close into the planet. So we will be observing IO from afar as well, but no close flybys. So, uh, as is the case with many missions, uh, JUICE um, didn't begin as, uh, as the mission we now know. Um, the first proposal was for a mission called Laplace, um, and then there was a proposal for a joint mission with, uh, with NASA, so NASA would build the, an Europa orbiter, and ESA would uh, uh, develop a Ganymede orbiter, and they'd launch uh, to work together uh, in a mission called the Europa Jupiter System Mission, or EJSM. So NASA, unfortunately, uh, withdrew uh, their involvement in that mission, and the European Space Agency decided to push on with JGO, the Jupiter Ganymede uh, Orbiter, uh, which was after that uh, named the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE. So that's the origin of the mission. Um, so it's got a uh, very wide support from the European um, planetary community, 
and uh, you'll see that uh, it also carries some instruments from NASA, so it has a very significant contribution from our colleagues uh, on the other side of the Atlantic uh, as well. So um, I've touched on some of the science topics already, but what's the overriding, uh, or what are the overriding reasons for um, uh, going to Jupiter with the, the JUICE mission and designing the mission in this way? So we want to look at uh, these worlds, uh, the Galilean satellites. Um, we believe that they are habitable. So Europa's got, we believe or suspect, everything that we need for life. So we have plenty of water. Uh, the colouring of the surface near the cracks of uh, Europa indicates that lots of chemicals mixed in with the, the water as well under the surface. And we know there's lots of heat there as well from tidal energy. And they appear to be the, the ingredients we need for life uh, to potentially begin, or at least it is habitable. Whether there's life there now is a, is a bigger question that would have to be answered by, by future missions. Um, but also, uh, more generally, they want to learn about the Jupiter, Jupiter system as an archetype for gas giants as well. So four of the planets in our solar system uh, are more similar to Jupiter than they are to uh, Earth. Um, so by learning about Jupiter, which is the easiest planet to get to in the outer solar system, we learn more about uh, the other outer planets as well. And if we take an even further step back, the more we're learning about exoplanets, uh, we're discovering more and more of them, uh, the more we're able to apply uh, what we learn about uh, gas giants to um, what we know, the limited amounts we know about exoplanets, many of which are very massive themselves. So um, we've got several science themes. So for the, the first one, uh, the emergence of habitable worlds around gas giants, um, we can split it into three main areas. So Ganymede uh, itself, which is the largest satellite in the solar system. Deep down, we believe it also has a, a global ocean between icy layers, but not as close to the surface as, uh, as in the case of Europa. It has an internal dynamo, so it's got its own magnetic field, uh, which we don't understand at the moment. So we'd like to learn how that's formed. Um, the surface, uh, from the information we have from previous missions, has got a, um, a rich range of crater styles. So some of them are flat, some of them are very steep, and that tells us that maybe the surface is different in different regions. Uh, and it's the archetype of, of uh, water worlds. So we may find, as we uh, discover more and more exoplanets in the future, um, planets with similar um, uh, environments to Ganymede um, will be able to uh, apply what we know about this moon to those uh, other worlds as well. Um, Europa is fascinating in itself, so we'll have a couple of flybys of Europa as well. It may be active now, and uh, it's an ocean under the surface in contact with silicates, uh, which suggests a chemically rich uh, salty ocean under the surface. And finally, Callisto. Uh, so it hasn't changed as much as the other planets over time, so it provides a lot of information about uh, the uh, impacts that have occurred in the, in the Jupiter system, so we'll learn more about the very, very long-scale history of, uh, of the solar system. And then for Jupiter itself, um, we're learning a lot about uh, the planet itself, its rings and its magnetosphere. So uh, in the top box, you can see we're going to learn about uh, the atmospheres so of fluid dynamics, chemistry, and meteorology. At Jupiter, we haven't had a spacecraft observing uh, the planet uh, close up for long periods. Galileo would have done that if, uh, if it hadn't had the antenna problem. So it really will uh, provide a revolution in our understanding of, uh, of the Jovian uh, atmosphere. The magnetosphere, uh, although we, we can detect radio emissions from, magnet from the magnetosphere, we can only learn things in detail by actually going there with, with instruments. So uh, arguably the magnetosphere of Jupiter, this big magnetic cage uh, surrounding the planet, if you were able to see it with the naked eye, it would actually be larger than the full moon as seen from Earth. Um, despite being several astronomical units away. So it's, it's a huge um, cage, magnetic cage around the planet with a very long tail that stretches away from the, from the sun. Um, 
that it's got very intense radiation belts, uh, very energetic particles, electrons and ions around the planet, but we don't know exactly how those ions and electrons reach those incredibly high energies and how those radiation belts are formed. So we hope to learn about that and we'll be able to apply it to astrophysical situations as well. So. Um, uh, similar acceleration going on at, uh, in um, stellar contexts elsewhere in the universe. And then we'll learn more about um, the Jovian satellite and ring systems. We'll learn about the rings, observing them from afar. Uh, and the connection, as I showed you earlier, the auroral uh, spots that connect Jupiter uh, to the, uh, the Galilean moons. So the science aims for the, uh, for the individual targets, for Europa. We want to learn what the composition of the, uh, the non-ice material is. So the view on the, on the left there is the trailing side of Europa. So as, as Europa orbits Jupiter, it's tidally locked like our moon. So the same face always faces Jupiter. This is the trailing side, so Jupiter is on the, on the left. And it's actually quite brown compared to the other hemisphere. And the reason for that is that uh, lots of ions, uh, these energetic ions, are, are constantly bombarding the surface. Um, and we'll learn about um, what that makeup of that brownish material is. Some of it comes up from beneath the surface, but a lot of it is from ions coming from elsewhere. Uh, the suspicion is that lots of those ions ultimately came from Io, which is spewing out huge amounts of sulfur, sodium and other materials into, into space, and a lot of them end up on the surface uh, of Europa. We want to learn about the subsurface, uh, how thick is the crust and what's happening uh, uh, under the surface. Uh, is the, the, the moon active now? And it does have a very tenuous atmosphere, so we will sweep through the atmosphere at high speed during the two flybys uh, and directly sample the atmosphere of Europa. So during the two flybys, there are targeted regions that the, the cameras uh, will, will look at closely. Um, so those pink areas will be imaged at, uh, at high resolution. So with Ganymede, we've got slightly different goals, some of them similar to Europa, but uh, uh, not all of them. So we want to learn about uh, the interior, um, how the magnetic field is formed, and uh, this water layer, how deep is it? Uh, we want to learn about the geology and the surface composition and the, the difference between the poles and the equator, where um, ge uh, material from uh, Jupiter's magnetosphere doesn't reach. Again, Ganymede has got a very thin atmosphere, which we'll learn about um, directly from passing through it and learning about the magnetosphere and uh, the plasma environment. And uh, JUICE will arrive at the Jupiter system, as I'll show you a bit later. We'll go into orbit around Jupiter, but its ultimate target will be Ganymede, so it'll actually go into orbit around Ganymede itself at the end, uh, and it'll go through different orbital phases so elliptical orbit to begin with, and then a circular mapping orbit, uh, another elliptical phase, and then a lower altitude um, mapping orbit as well. So we'll learn, we'll have global maps of Ganymede uh, and learn about it in exquisite detail. And then Callisto, we want to learn about uh, the geology of the body from the past. Uh, there might be an ocean there as well. Um, it's less likely, but uh, some suggest that it is present there as well. Uh, and learn about what the non-icy material on this brownish uh, moon's surface actually is. So a Callisto will have many flybys during the mission, uh, many of them actually passing over the same regions, uh, but we will learn a huge amount of, about this moon as well. So Jupiter itself. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there are some wavelengths that the light doesn't get down to uh, Earth's atmosphere. So the only way of studying it, um, studying Jupiter at these wavelengths is to have a space observatory or to actually go there with, with uh, more modest uh, remote sensing instruments to map things at high resolution. Um, but from looking at Jupiter at different wavelengths, ultraviolet, visible, uh, several different uh, colors uh, and the infrared, uh, we'll learn about um, the Jovian atmosphere, where the heat is coming up from beneath the surface or the cloud tops, um, and how the energy is spread through the atmosphere. 
Jupiter gives off more energy than it um, than the Sun provides it with. So there is an internal source of heat inside Jupiter. So it's important to understand uh, where this energy goes um, and how it drives the weather systems on, on Jupiter as well. So we'll learn uh, a huge amount about the planet as well from these long-term close-up observations. And then finally, uh, an area I'm involved in, but arguably is the, most, <laughs> the least uh, accessible uh, to the public, the magnetosphere, which you can't see, but is incredibly important to understanding uh, the moons and how they interact with the, the Jovian system. Um, so we have this very strong magnetic field with lots of particles trapped inside it with very strong radiation belts. And they're at their strongest close to the planet. And as I mentioned, that's why we're not going in uh, um, to the orbit of Io. Um, we want to learn about Ganymede's magnetosphere inside a magnetosphere, uh, how the surfaces of these moons are, are affected by ions and electrons striking them. Uh, we know that Io is there throwing out huge amounts of material all the time through its volcanoes. Where does all that material go? Uh, a lot of it is almost certainly ionized and is actually forming uh, the particles in the radiation belts. And then finally, how do these moons map um, to, the, to Jupiter itself? So we've got magnetic field lines uh, from Jupiter passing these moons and we, we generate currents um, which produce those auroral spots that I show you, showed you earlier. Um, so we're incredibly excited about this mission. Um, it is a frustratingly long time away though. Um, so it's going to uh, arrive to properly doing science from 2030 onwards. So it'll be launched in 2022 though. So we are incredibly busy uh, designing uh, the instruments and now the spacecraft itself. So last summer, uh, the European Space Agency chose the prime contractor, the, the company that's going to build uh, JUICE, and it's going to be built by Airbus Defence and Space in Toulouse in France. And this is the design that uh, Airbus came up with. So you'll, um, you'll see in some earlier images it had long uh, solar panels like Rosetta. Um, so the design that actually is going to fly on JUICE is, has got these two cross-shaped solar panels, so they'll unfold once uh, JUICE is safely uh, in space. So um, at the moment, all the instrument teams have been selected. I'll run through the instruments uh, in a moment. Um, some of them obviously want to carry out remote sensing, so they all probably want to point in roughly the same direction. So all the cameras are on uh, one face of the, of the spacecraft at the top there, um, where optical bench uh, uh, stated, and then other instruments, they want to sample material that we're passing through, so they're mounted elsewhere on the, on the spacecraft uh, to try and keep everyone happy, all the different science teams. So this summarizes uh, the spacecraft, so it's, uh, it's a very large spacecraft, the launch mass uh, is going to be over 5 metric tons, 220 kilograms uh, roughly uh, will be set aside for instruments and uh, 2.8 tons of, uh, of propellant. The, the solar arrays, um, we are going to be very far from the sun and previous missions such as Galileo relied on uh, plutonium um, power sources to, to uh, power the, the spacecraft. Solar array technology has advanced a lot, so uh, Rosetta um, has operated very far from the sun and this summer uh, the Juno spacecraft will be the first uh, spacecraft to operate at Jupiter itself, uh, relying on solar panels. So these very large solar arrays um, will generate around 850 watts at, uh, at Jupiter. So despite their very large size, we are quite far from the, from the sun. Um, and that's the amount of power. So that has to be shared between all the instruments and the, the spacecraft uh, systems as well. 
Uh, it's got a fixed high gain antenna, so to send the, the data back to Earth at high rates, you have to point the whole spacecraft towards Earth uh, and send the data back. But it's also got a steerable uh, medium gain antenna as well, where you don't have to reorient the spacecraft. And we're expecting a data volume of over 1.4 gigabits uh, per day, which is a decent amount, but uh, it gets filled up very quickly because um, all the instrument teams want to take as much data as they possibly can, which is understandable, of course. So this is an incredibly uh, complex mission, but uh, the, already uh, the other important bits of the mission are, are being planned. Um, uh, which the public don't see quite as much of, so we have to plan how we're getting the data down from the ESA ground stations, uh, how we're going to operate the mission from Darmstadt in, uh, in Germany at ESOC. Uh, the Science Operations Centre is outside Madrid at ESAC, and that was going to be the, pr the main point of contact for all the science teams um, with the running the, the instruments on the, on the spacecraft. And it's going to be launched in 2022 on an Ariane 5, which, as we heard earlier from, from Mark, an incredibly reliable launcher, uh, which will set it on its long trip to Jupiter. So I'll just quickly skim through all the instruments. So um, probably the most visible uh, data to the public will come from Janus, uh, the visible camera system. Um, so we at MSSL are, are on the science team for this instrument. So this is going to take all the, uh, the images that uh, are visible and near infrared range. So it's got uh, uh, 13 filters uh, imaging the surface of, uh, of the moons and the cloud tops of Jupiter at high resolution. So we'll get up to a res resolution of a, a couple of meters uh, at Ganymede uh, at, at its best. And then we're also looking at other wavelengths as well. So um, further in the infrared, uh, we have Magus. Um, and in the ultraviolet, one of the instruments provided uh, from a team led by um, from the US, uh, UVS, uh, run by Randy Gladstone. Um, so these three instruments will provide a wide wavelength range um, mapping of the surfaces of the icy moons, uh, complementing each other. And uh, also observations of, of Jupiter itself. So one of the areas that we're particularly interested in at MSSL is the aurora of Jupiter. So you can actually image the aurora on Jupiter uh, on the day side in ultraviolet, um, and but on the night side, that's the only place where you can map the uh, the visible aurora. So already we're having to discuss how we're going to uh, image the aurora on the night side of Jupiter and making sure that some time is set aside uh, for doing this. Um, so all the instrument teams are already working together in different working groups, already planning how they're going to share the data between them uh, and who gets uh, which, uh, um, which data volume shares already despite uh, 14 years until uh, we're actually going to gather the data. So at slightly longer wavelengths, we also have uh, um, uh, imaging and of the um, of different bodies at uh, a microwave wavelengths, um, and also uh, other instruments are going to tell us more about the the icy moons themselves. So there's a laser altimeter which will will tell us incredibly accurately the distance between juice and. Uh, uh, any moon that we're passing close to. So this will fire a laser beam down at the, the surface. So when it reaches um, the surface, the spot will be about 40 meters across, and then the, it's reflected back up to the, the spacecraft. And then by timing the time it takes for the laser beam to hit the surface and come back, you can get the, the distance very accurately. So we're going to get um, accuracy of about 10 centimeters or better, which is incredibly uh, precise. So we'll learn about the shapes of the moons and as the tides are changing the shapes of the moons we should see it in the laser altimeter data as well. Um, and also the, the data will return information about how rough the surfaces are and how reflective um, they are. Uh, we're also going to penetrate through the, uh, the surface with a penetrating radar to measure the crust, how thick the crust is. And then we come to uh, some of the in situ instruments. So JMAG is a magnetometer led from Imperial College um, that's going to measure the magnetic field. 
And then we're providing hardware for a plasma instrument called PEP, uh, which is truly multinational, so led from Sweden and Switzerland, with contributions from uh, Germany, uh, Hungary, uh, the US, and from the UK uh, through us at MSSL. And then to round things up, we've got radio instruments, so measuring <coughs> radio emissions near Jupiter from RPWI, uh, and then looking at the Doppler shifts, how fast the spacecraft is moving and how the speed changes uh, with these two instruments um, to accurately measure uh, the Doppler shift and uh, learn about the interior structure, structure of the moons through those observations. So uh, time is short, so I'll just quickly um, run you through the, the mission plan. So we're going to launch in 2022, and as with many other missions, we're going to have multiple flybys of inner planets to gain enough speed. Um, so we'll have flybys of Earth and Venus to pick up enough speed to get out to Jupiter, arriving uh, to do science from 2030 onwards. And we, when we arrive at Jupiter, we'll have one uh, sneak preview of Ganymede, and then have a, an engine burn, uh, marked here by JOI, Jupiter Orbit Insertion, that will slow us down to make sure that we're in orbit around Jupiter. Our first orbit will be very, very long, uh, and then later on we'll return closer into the mission to, to map the, the moons. So I'll skip through different parts of this um, animation. So at the beginning we're very far from Jupiter once we're in this long elongated orbit. Uh, later, later on we're much closer in uh, and the inclination of the orbit will go up. Um, so we'll be able to look down at the poles of Jupiter um, to learn more about the planet itself rather than the, the moons. And then towards the end, we're back to the equator uh, and ultimately in orbit around Ganymede itself. So we'll have two flybys of Europa, 11 of Ganymede and uh, 13 of Callisto. And if all goes well, uh, this is the site we'll have when we arrive at Ganymede, the ultimate uh, aim of the, of the mission. So if you keep your eyes on the center of the screen, you'll see that Ganymede gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger. So after spending uh, a couple of years st studying Jupiter and uh, the other moons, we'll finally arrive at Ganymede itself. Uh, we'll fire the engines uh, to slow it down, and then we're captured by Ganymede's um, gravitational field, and we'll be in a polar orbit around Ganymede. So, as has happened before, uh, earlier today, I've got too much uh, uh, exciting material to show you, so I'll have to skip through the, the last bits. Um, but just to mention, we have Juno um, arriving in July this year, and uh, NASA will be sending a spacecraft to Europa in 2022, and a, a large group of us in Europe hope to uh, propose a penetrator to actually land on the surface as well. Uh, we'll be proposing that to ESA as a contribution to, to NASA uh, later this year. So just to wind things up, as uh, Mark mentioned earlier, JUICE is, is a temporary name, uh, so there's probably going to be a, a competition to, to name it. Uh, if you do take part, then take some inspiration um, or guidance from the existing name JUICE. Uh, concentrate. Uh, it is a pressing matter. Okay, so thank you.